thank you very much for the chance to be here, Steve. Um, this is joint work with Dominic Bartolome, uh, Arnaud Costano, and Andres rodriguez Claire, who is uh, in the room and will field questions later. Um, this is a paper about external economies of scale. So I'm sure you have at least four questions in your mind right now. What are external economies of scale? And uh, why should we care about them? And why do they matter? And I'll, I'll try to talk about that uh, over the next 20 minutes. In terms of the what, uh, what are economies of, external economies of scale? Well, think of this as sort of the, uh, the economies of scale in production. We're going to focus on like in a location, in a country, in an industry that are external to the, the firms in that industry. That is something that the, 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 the individual firms are too small to affect but they're very real in the large, or potentially very real. And I want to contrast that with internal economies of scale, which are also probably very real, but those are already sort of the things that the firms can affect and so presumably are affecting and are already, in a sense, internalizing. So from a policy perspective, we often draw a, a very sharp uh, line when it comes to external economies of scale, which is something that, in principle, policy could help an economy to exploit better. Uh, why should one care about that? Well, partly for the policy motivation I just gave, but also, you know, there's a long-standing intellectual interest in this. This goes back to Marshall, uh, Mill, and, and carries, carries right through a whole chain of recent work. That includes um, a sort of whole class of workhorse models that the trade, geography, growth economists use every day, in which they don't explicitly have external economies of scale in their models, but they have something else due to endogenous entry uh, of the number of firms that the consumers value uh, that acts exactly like an external economy of scale for the purposes of uh, everything I talk about today. So it's very central to much of what we do. In some sense, it's so central to much of what we do that um, we, uh, as trade economists nowadays, have a lot of unification across a wide class of models we use, often called gravity models of trade, where, in a sense, within that class, everything is unified except for how large are the economy, external economies of scale. Uh, they can be zero. That is not at all existent. They can be very large, as in those canonical approaches. Um, or they could be somewhere in between or even bigger than those approaches, and we just don't know. And if we could just sort of uh, hone in on that empirically, we would know a lot more about how to apply our models to lots of questions, all trade questions in a sense, including maybe most centrally questions about industrial policy. So as I mentioned, I highlighted earlier, if you think there's some wonderful economy of scale in your location, in your sector that you think is important, but the firms are not already taking advantage of, then policy, often called industrial policy, could be used to help that economy to exploit that better. That would be a Pareto improvement, uh, at least within that economy. Okay, so how large are these external economies of scale? Well, that's um, a classically hard thing to estimate. Uh, that I, I think it's fair to say we still don't, uh, as economists, know a whole lot about. Uh, in a sense that there are many challenges. Um, one is getting the metric of success right uh, of an industry, and the other is getting a sort of exogenous change in the scale uh, of, of the local industries with which to study how success uh, changes when scale changes. And so what we're going to do today is sort of um, going to sort of try to make progress on both those steps. The first is sort of that is that in, in, a, in a kind of fundamental sense, the way that countries trade uh, says a lot in the mo kind of models we use as trade economists about the right uh, notion of aggregate productivity in a sector um, country. And so they reveal, and trade data in a sense reveals that right notion. The second point is that uh, trade, uh, that is the interacting uh, global economy, generates a lot of um, sources of variation in the scale, the size of a country industry that uh, are plausibly driven by factors that have nothing to do with that uh, sector industry's other sources of success. And that we're going to sort of try to leverage those, uh, that other source of variation driven by foreign elements of demand to estimate economies of scale. The quick punchline is we'll, uh, in, in every sector we look at, these are sort of pretty, pretty broad manufacturing aggregates, we see positive external economies of scale. They range between those two numbers I put there, 0 0.02 and 0 0.2. Think of that as a 2% elasticity to a tw to a uh, or an elasticity of 0 0.02 or to elasticity of 0.2. The, what the 0.2 means is that if you were to double your industry size in a, in a given location, that industry size would become 20% more physically 20% more productive in the right aggregate sense. Uh, so that's a pretty big effect. I think most people would agree. Standard estimates tend to lie in that, that range as well. It's, we're not sort of saying anything um, 
quantitatively that different from previous work, I would say, on this. Um, so given those large, fairly large and, and, uh, and omnipresent across sectors, external economies of scale, the next question would be how successful could that idealized optimal industrial policy be that would exploit those large external economies of scale? Here, uh, we were surprised by the answer that comes out of the standard uh, machinery that, 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 all, um, that all, all trade economists are using nowadays. The answer turns out to be quite small. So the gains would be about 0.2% uh, about, uh, of GDP. This includes for large countries, small countries, open countries, uh, closed, more closed countries. The, that number is fairly robust across the countries we look at. Just to put that in context, what do we mean by small? Well, in exactly the same environment, optimal trade policy um, that is uh, not industrial policy that leverages these external economies of scale, but optimal trade policy that leverages something different, which is to do with purely terms of trade manipulation, um, uh, would be bigger for, on average for these countries. And that surprised uh, me at least. So that's kind of the paper in a nutshell. The rest uh, is just details. I, um, uh, if, you, if you don't like details, this might be a good time to grab coffee. Um, <laughs> So, um, I, uh, just one thing I want to flag about prior work on this, of which there's been a, a great deal. Um, one is that this idea of using trade to measure productivity goes back, um, uh, at least I saw this first in the work of Eaton Cordham. It's been applied in many useful contexts since then. The second is that there's um, been a lot of work in the trade context on sort of these external economies of scale, mostly under the guise of, of testing for and estimating the strength of the home market effect, which is very much tied into external economies of scale. It's this basic idea that, uh, as coined by Paul Krugman in 1980 article, that if you have a large domestic demand for something, that might actually make you more successful at exporting that thing. That's the so-called home market effect, which only tends to arise if there are these external economies of scale. And finally, uh, people have tried to estimate external returns to scale um, within uh, using purely domestic data from one country. Uh, these are representative uh, recent uh, works on, uh, that have done that. I'll have a bit more to say about some of the pros and cons of that approach uh, as we go. OK, so in terms of just the raw theory that's needed to, to make this sing, um, think of a, a world where there are lots of countries, uh, I'm going to call them I and J. Goods are always going to go from I to J. And then sectors indexed by little s, lots of sectors. Inside a sector, there are lots of goods. Uh, I'm going to call those the, the omelides there. So then technologies are, um, are pretty unrestricted. What we're going to need, though, is that um, after all is said and done, there are no um, uh, economies of scale left to be exploited at the raw production level. All the economies of scale that exist are going to be external. So that is to say that production will uh, be produced Q with some inputs L, the whole vector potentially of inputs, uh, with some productivity A that the firms take as given. But then that productivity A is a function of the scale of the industry, which we're going to prox uh, proxy by capital L. You could have other proxies too. That's basically an empirical matter. But that's a function A of L that is potentially upward sloping. That would be positive external economies of scale. Or potentially downward sloping, that would be a negative external economies of scale. OK, in terms of the demand side, this is also extremely unrestricted at the, at the within ind industry level. How all those goods get organized into what consumers want, we don't uh, need to take a stand on. In principle, also, you could have where the, the preferences, the quality, perceived consumer quality of goods, call it B, is also a function of scale. That, that also is something that we could, uh, in, a, in a sense, be estimating as well. So some mixture of the A function there and the B function there is what we mean by the external economies of scale. OK, so um, putting all that together, the, um, if, if in an environment of perfect competition, uh, that is, these, uh, perfect, uh, these firms all interacting as if all is too small to affect prices, then um, and too small to affect the L of their sector in their country, that's the external part of the economies of scale, then um, it, you can show that uh, the trading behavior X, meaning the uh, value of trade from I to J in sector S, that's you know, sitting in the data all around us, the bilateral trade data, is always going to be some function, I'm going to call it chi, of these arguments. And those arguments are written here. But basically, think of those things as costs. They're, they're, the, they're, the, they're the costs that um, the producers uh, face when they produce these goods and sell them around the world. Right? OK, so then under some, uh, I think, pretty weak in the grand scheme of things technical assumption, that, that function chi will always exist and always be invertible. 
And that means that one could sort of, if you knew that function chi, you could just stick your trade data into it and uh, back out those costs C. And I'm, that's what I'm going to refer to as sort of trade revealed productivity or inverse productivity costs. Differencing that across sectors differences out the variable costs that, uh, that, are, that are common. And that leaves an expression basically where the sort of the difference in costs across two sectors and two exporting economies is a function of their uh, differences in scale, scaled up by those unknown economies of scale function E. Sorry, what, what is E? E is just the, the confluence of both the A function and the B function. That's the relevant external economy of scale function that matters for everything we do. And so that is what is sitting right here, in a sense, in the data around us uh, for one to try to estimate. So the Cs are data, like in the sense the Xs are data. You stick the Xs into the chi function that you sort of either know or could try to estimate. That gives you C. C then has some relation to the Ls that are data. That relationship is the E function, which we're all dying to know, because that is the external economies of scale function that is the key ingredient for policy. OK, so the paper goes through a lot of the technical details of how one could hope to know E from the standard data. Uh, the basic idea is, uh, though hopefully fairly intuitive, you need exogenous variation in those Ls to sort of stick into the, um, to, to, to allow you to trace out those E functions by how they relate to the Cs. OK. so. There are other approaches to estimating external economies of scale. Let me just flag the two that are, that are, that are famous. Um, one is sort of just go to the microdata and figure out how this works with firms. That, that's a quick summary of this. So this would require all the data on the micro prices, the micro quantities, the micro factor allocations. From those data, in principle, you could estimate all the micro production functions inside your industry and your country, and all the demand uh, and the entire demand system across all those micro goods within your country sector. That um, has a wonderful advantage, which is that it um, allows you to then speak about micro aspects of the problem. Like you could talk about how industrial policy favors some firms and maybe harms others within a given country industry. W a disadvantage of what I'm talking about today is we can't speak about those micro aspects. Uh, a kind of cost, however, of going to this micro stuff is in a sense you have to estimate a whole bunch of micro details that are irrelevant for the procedure I'm talking about today. So all of that within industry stuff inside the uh, production functions and the demand system is totally irrelevant for, for what I'm talking about today, whereas it would be totally necessary if you were to go down this route. Um, the, the, the insight here, obviously, is that, in a sense, the, the economies of scale are aggregate in nature. So aggregate data is, in some sense, what you need to use. Uh, you know, the, the micro details that, that, that go inside that aggregate data, it, sh it shouldn't be surprising to say that the micro details aren't really strongly necessary. So another approach would use aggregate data that would draw on sort of um, idealized kind of uh, industry level quality and variety adjusted internationally comparable price indices at the aggregate level. You know, in principle, those things exist. Textbooks are written about them. I think a, a fair statement is that it's extremely hard to collect such data, and it, it doesn't uh, really exist. I think it, it's fair to say. Basically, the problem is comparing prices across countries within sectors is extremely hard to do. Um, it's extremely hard to do across many sectors and, and countries. Uh, doing all those, the problem is doing all the variety and quality adjustments um, when the good space is just so complicated, basically, uh, in, within the sectors. Um, OK, so that's, that's, uh, that's, th those are two alternative approaches. They have pros and cons. Um, I, uh, the, the, the beautiful idea behind price indices is that if you had the data, then everything would work perfectly. I think the main the con is that we just might not have the data. All right, so in terms of looking at this empirically, however, so I referred, referred earlier to that, that chi function. So I, I said earlier you would have to sort of know what it is. I wanted to stress that obviously for computing policy counterfactual simulations later, you'd also have to know what it is. So it's kind of unavoidable that we have to know why these countries trade, who trades what with whom. That's all the chi function, and it's kind of unavoidable for these questions. So, you know, uh, and it's no surprise, therefore, that it's the bread and butter of trade economists to estimate, in some sense, these chi functions. The most popular chi function of them all, by far is this one, which happens to be a CES chi function. And that's the gravity model, basically. So we're going to stick to that, too. It's not necessary. One could stick in, stick in any chi function you like, but we're going to stick to the most canonical one. We're also going to stick to the most canonical representation of that E function, which is just it's an isoelastic um, uh, function of, sca of scale with an a constant elasticity parameter gamma. That's the thing I referred to earlier that is somewhere between 0 and 0.2 in our estimates. So as a bonus, this Nest then um, famous workhorse 
non-perfectly competitive, but monopolistically competitive models like the ones that Krugman and, 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 and Mellitz, et cetera, uh, have uh, made famous and tractable. Those are nested in this chi system and this E function, so they're, they're included in what I say from now on as well. Okay, so um, in terms of running this, this estimation, you need to look at something like the difference in difference I referred to earlier across sectors and across exporters. That, has, that is analogous to running it in levels like this, but with sort of fixed effects to control for the differences in some sense. So that looks um, ho hopefully relatively standard to, to trade economists in this room. We're regressing trade data on certain fixed effects and on then on sector-specific scale with a sector-specific scale elasticity. The parameter theta matters a lot for everything I show you. So far, we're just taking that value from the literature. Five is a canonical estimate of that trade elasticity number. Um, uh, everything I say, you could just today you could just replace with a different theta. Um, but for now, I'll just be working on five, uh, working with five. Okay, so the final thing to talk about is instruments. So here, basically, we're going to try to um, leverage some very basic uh, ec economic insights, uh, you might say. The first is that sectors differ potentially in what we would call their angle-like angle elasticity. So that is to say how, the, how con consumers or demanders, their expenditure per capita, that is how much they're buying in a sector in a given buying country J, how that depends on their own income per capita. So, so obviously, if, if at homothetic preferences, all those functions would be the same, but with potentially non-homothetic preferences and other sources of non-homotheticity, that G of S function might be different across S. And we're just going to sort of run that regression and estimate those G of S's as flexibly as we can. So as it happens, we don't want to use Y over L. We think that that might be conflated with things involving productivity. We didn't want to get involved in that. So we're just never going to use Y over L. We're going to set and use a, a thing that's known to be a pretty good predictor of a country's GDP per capita, which is just this, which is sort of how far is country J? That's the D, this D for distance there. D to negative power means you're, if you're far, that's bad. Uh, from big countries with size L bar, that's the size of their population. So basically, we're just predicting your GDP per capita with how big are your neighbors. That's as simple as that is. So, so this regression sort of estimates whether in sectors where you, uh, you know, for countries that have big neighbors, do they consume more, relatively more, of sector kind of number one than they do in sector number two. That's what that G function would embody. Okay, the second thing is then just to construct a variable I'm gonna call Z, that's gonna be the instrument, which is gonna be this, this, um, this sum again. Uh, for the, now I'm trying to construct an instrument for the size of country I. So this is, think of this as like a proxy for the demand that in sector S, country I's producers face. So they're going to face a lot of de demand if they're near, so if I is near, to other countries, J, that are big. And that's going to matter more if that's in a sector with a high kind of beta. Pay beta there is the is a sort of uh, the proxy for how much people spend their money on that sector, S. And those shares, beta, we're going to proxy from this function we estimated up here. So think about it as kind of like, you know, if you're... If you're a, a country that is near to other big countries, then that's going to push up demand. But we're going to, that's not enough for us because we need to sort of study how it pushes up demand more in one sector than another. All of that will come through this G function that we've estimated in like a first, first stage, a, a sort of zeroth stage, if you like. Okay, so the, um, so, so the, the the, uh, the, the results that come out of that when you stick that kind of estimating assumption into OECD uh, data with 61 countries, 34 man uh, 27 traded manufacturing sectors, pooling over four years, although we get very similar estimates if we just pick any one of those same years, it's fundamentally a cross-sectional identification strategy, look like this. So this, what this implies is that, um, so first of all, our, our first stage does successfully predict demand. So it is the case that you can predict the size of a sector in terms of the number of workers that work in that country sector, as just a function of like, the size of their neighbors interacted with that angle, uh, that differential angle elasticity by sectors. You know, I, I have to be honest, I wasn't sure that that would be a good predictor, but it turns out to uh, have power in like the first stage there, literally. Um, so taking that literally and pooling across all sectors uh, to estimate in the external economy of, pra uh, of scale parameter, we get about 13, uh, 0.13 on average. Um, uh, but that, of course, 
is pooling across all sectors. If you look at this separately by sectors, you get the numbers I told you about in the introduction. The range from about 0 0.02 in the food, beverages, and tobacco sector to here, here's a, here, these are the two, sect the two pages worth of sectors. Um, but the biggest is 0.2, um, a, a, which is achieved by a couple of sectors. So they're in that range. They're all, all I think, uh, Sorry, not all. I think it's something like 75% of them are statistically di significantly different from zero on the positive side. And there is, in a sense, a strong first stage within each of these sectors. That's what that last column is trying to say. Okay, so in the, in the final time I have left, let me just talk about optimal policy. So this requires a little bit more because you now have to sort of, so so far everything was sort of taking many things about the economy at some aggregate level as given and then just predicting who will trade that stuff with whom. Now we have to actually sort of solve and sort of close the model for everything. Um, that requires additional assumptions, but they're, um, they're unavoidable in some sense uh, and, um, and, uh, and necessary for this kind of analysis. Another very important ingredient is what is the gamma, that economies of scale parameter, in the other sectors that, are not, that we can't estimate because they're not traded data. That's a very important parameter. We're going to take for now, just assume that thing is the mean gamma. Uh, among the ones we do estimate. So that's like saying that the other sectors are kind of, you know, the, the sectors we do estimate are a representative sample of the sectors as a whole. Uh, we play around with that in many different ways in the paper. So I'll talk about optimal industrial policy, which is just purely where you're kind of trying to scale up production in sectors that have good external economies of scale parameters. Optimal trade policy is totally different. It's about scaling, it's about changing your tariffs in the world market to try to manipulate the world price for your good. That's uh, called improving your terms of trade. Trade, of course, that's completely standard and done very often. So here are those estimates I referred to in the introduction. Now, sort of, I'll show you the world averages I talked about early on. So what we do here is we sort of take a country like the United States and ask, starting from where the U.S. is today, give it its best possible industrial policy in our model, and that answer is 0.1% for China, for the U.S. Do the same thing separately for China, the answer is also about 0.1%. So that surprised me. I kind of thought that uh, in the world we live in, external economies of scale are big. A country like China would gain massively from optimal industrial policy. It's going from where they are to some optimal industrial policy. Um, but that's not big for China either, as you can see the world average I talked about in the introduction. These are equivalent gains from trade optimal, taking the same country but doing optimal trade policy. And, and as you can see, for all of these countries, they're at least kind of, they're on average, bigger. Um, you might think, well, that's because you're not optimally combining trade and industrial policy. So the last column kind of offers these countries the best possible policy vector in this environment. E even that is not particularly big. Why are these things so small? Well, the quick answer is that um, there's two things to say about this. The first is that the only reason you'd want to do industrial policy in any of the models that we or, uh, or other economists would talk about would be that you, you're trying to expand one sector because it's too small. That unfortunately means you're going to have to shrink some other sector. So it's all about the heterogeneity in those gammas. So in a sense, we find big economies of scale, but they're big for most sectors, <laughs> which kind of means you can't pick a winner and make him bigger, uh, 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 because unfortunately, therefore, you have to make some other sector smaller. And that means you're going to lose the opportunity to have good industrial policy in that other sector. Now, of course, there is the big outside sector, the non-tradable sector. So that's where the economies of scale parameter in that sector matter a lot. But setting it to zero, which would be like an extreme bound, you know, where the other sector has no economies of scale, that only leads to global gains on uh, average country gains that are only 0.3%. So we don't think that is the most uh, important explanation for these findings. The second point is that you, uh, whenever you try to make a sector big in an economy like this, you run into, um, or, or, or small, you run into the constraints of demand. Um, so if you wanted to try to grow these big tradable manufacturing sectors that, in which industrial policy is greatly beneficial, you would have to shrink something else. You might shrink the non-traded sectors. Um, but unfortunately, if those are not traded, you know, people, consumers want those goods. And so they're going to, in a some sense, complain that they're not getting them. You know? and, and so there's this tension between, you, you basically you want like high elasticity gamma in some tradable sectors and not other tradable sectors where you can massively expand in those sectors. So that's just not happening in standard trade models, basically. Okay, um, I'll conclude by just reminding you that you know, the, the main goal here was to try to um, develop new tools for estimating economies of scale. This draws on the basic insight that the, the right notion for aggregate uh, productivity in these environments is revealed in trade data, we think. Um, and furthermore, foreign demand shocks, I think, have the plausible hope for generating variation in a country sector scale that has nothing to do with their productivity. 
Uh, based on those basic insights, we see large scale elasticity, I think, but pretty small gains from industrial policy at those elasticities. Um, obviously, this is work in progress. Uh, you know, there's tons of work we're trying to do to extend and check the robustness of this. A very important one is just how to add linkages across goods and sectors that are pecuniary linkages purely to do with input-output linkages. That could act like a multiplier on optimal industrial policy. That's an example of a kind of thing we're trying to figure out. Another thing one might try to estimate is external economies of scale elasticity spillovers that don't just, they're not just confined like in our setup to the sector industry, but also could spill over across sectors within the same country or even across countries within the same industry. That might be a real phenomenon. I don't know good evidence for it, but uh, in principle, one could use the same technology to try to find out. Uh, but I'll stop there. Thanks for your uh, attention. Thanks, thanks very much, Dave. And our second discussant is uh, David Weinstein, who's the Carl S. Shoup Professor of the Japanese Economy at Columbia University. Great. Well, thank, thanks very much for uh, inviting me here. It's, uh, it, it's, it's uh, great to have a chance to talk about this paper and uh, uh, to be here on such a nice sunny day in Princeton. Um, so I want to just begin by giving you a bit of an overview, and then I'm also going to get a bit into the weeds. Um, so this is a really ambitious paper. Um, and uh, as Dave explained, it, it, it provides us with a new way of thinking about and estimating uh, increasing returns using only trade data. And, and one of the, the things that uh, I think is really neat is that um, you know, we have these micro approaches to estimating these parameters. But uh, certainly as trade economists and macro economists, we're kind of are, are limited in some sense to the types of data that we can work with. And uh, thinking really seriously about how you can um, identify these parameters with the data sets that we have, I thought was, was, was really good. Um, and I thought also um, there were some interesting insights into when economies of scale matter um, at the aggregate level. And as uh, Dave was talking about, I thought these insights about how the sectors play off against each other, that I thought was really, really neat. And also, um, although I didn't talk much about this, um, when, when the scale economies don't matter so much, say at the firm level, which is in the paper, that's also a really neat uh, in, uh, insight. Um, and some, they're also really good um, um, you know, uh, calibration exercise at the end of the paper and just kind of felt, uh, you know, I should say kudos to the authors. Uh, you guys are doing, doing great work and I'm very, very enthusiastic. Um, that said, the paper is clearly at an early stage um, and, um, uh, you know, there are three sections that, 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 that are not quite as connected as they, as they could be and so I'm going to talk about some of the differences across the different uh, 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 sections. Uh, uh, the notation kind of varies uh, section by section, and then also I noticed there's slightly different notation in the presentation, so um, uh, so, 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 so it's a bit of a, uh, a challenge. Um, the other thing is the paper is, is covering a lot of ground, and so as a discussant, it's a bit tricky to, to know exactly what to focus on, but um, uh, I'll, I'm intrepid and we'll, we'll, we'll do the best. So you can kind of see the, the, the journey that the authors uh, traveled on uh, in writing this paper um, as, 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 as you read it. Um, and it's kind of a journey about how do we think about uh, estimating these economies of scale. Um, and actually, the paper is explicit about this. They start off in what they call asymptopia, right, which is the land of asymptotics, where you have infinite data, infinite time horizons. Uh, any variable you want is there. Uh, theory is beautiful, data is unlimited, and estimates are consistent, um, and that's a wonderful world. Um, you know, and economists are like rock stars, and you know, um, you know, in high school we never had problems on weekends. Everybody wanted to hang out with us, and <laughs> this kind of thing. So that's asymptopia. That's where we start, um, and then kind of the paper rapidly uh, descends into how to use actual data to estimate stuff. Um, which I might be called Hades. Um, that's actually the world that I live in, um, you know. And there you have all sorts of problems in the data, you know. And your referees are not nice. They have pitchforks and they poke you and things like this. Um, and uh, so this is kind of uh, uh, where I'll spend a lot of my time talking about is their is their struggles in 
um, in, in, in Hades. Um, and then they move um, to Gomorrah, not to be confused with the biblical Gomorrah, spelled with an O, uh, which is a general equilibrium model of real activity, um, which is basically this, this attempt to use some of the, the insights and then uh, develop industrial policy. And so kind of my, my, my big comment is that, you know, despite the attraction of Gomorrah, I think the next draft will let them achieve new insights of real value uh, for A, it should be capitalized, neoclassical analysis or nirvana. So that's where we're headed um, in, this, uh, in this analysis. So let's start with asymptopia and the basic idea about what it is that they're doing. So they're thinking utility is a function of quantity uh, and quality, and then, uh, they have this, this object quantity, so that quantity is going to be uh, a function of price, quality, and expenditure. Um, and then they're going to need to get some way of describing the prices to kind of get those that solve those out of the system. So prices are going to be a function of productivity, economies of scale, uh, quality, transport costs. Um, and then uh, based on that, uh, they're going to then plug those expressions into the demand system and um, they're going to kind of they're going to develop the framework that they've that they've got. And I, what I thought was kind of neat was just using this invertibility, these invertibility properties to kind of write down um, a trade model that's going to be a function of, of uh, uh, size. And then that lets you identify uh, the parameters. And I thought that was kind of a pretty, pretty neat idea. So I was, I was happy about that. Um, and then they have this very elegant result um, in which they show that uh, the double difference of log import shares, so that's a mouthful, so let me just try to say it in words. So if you were, let's say, to compare Canadian and U.S. exports of cars relative to Canadian and U.S. exports of wheat, uh, that could be decomposed into two elements. One is the scale term, and let me just uh, take it through the notation a little bit. Um, uh, so that's the scale term is this ES term, which is a function of some composite input. Um, uh, LN, N is going to be, you should think about N, they, they talk about it as economies, I think it's just time periods, so N is just time periods, um, from the exporter in the sector. And then that's going to be, uh, and, and how do these scale economies work? Well, there's one that's the A1, which affects the uh, productivity of the goods, and then there's this B1, which affects the quality of the, go of the goods. Um, and then they have this cost per unit um, uh, term, which that should be C-I-J-S, uh, not G, um, um, which is just the cost of shipping a good from I to J uh, at time T in, 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 in sector S, and that's going to be a function of transport cost, that tau term, uh, and then a productivity term, that alpha term, and then a quality term, that beta term. Um, and in order to do this, they need to make some, some assumptions. And so this is where I'm going to just talk a little bit about uh, what, they're, what they're doing. So in, the, so in the presentation, this was a little different. Um, but in the paper, um, uh, quanti uh, output is determined by um, kind of a time-bearing productivity shock times this function of the labor input at the firm level. And phi is going to be this, this productivity uh, parameter. Um, and quality is going to be similarly uh, um, uh, thought about. And so you're going to have um, uh, uh, some scale economies that can exist because uh, the, as you increase the amount of labor um, in the firm or the amount of, of the input, uh, uh, productivity can move around. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, so, so then productivity then is going to be some productivity shifter, this alpha uh, times the scale uh, effect at the, at the aggregate level. But kind of as I was thinking about that specification, um, so this is fine for thinking about external economies, but you have to kind of realize that, that there are many different ways in which external economies can be mattering um, that don't necessarily fit into this, right? So you could imagine that external economies affect certain factors and not other factors. Uh, so maybe it's human capital or maybe it's R&D. Um, or maybe it's about capital, or maybe it's about input-output linkages. I guess they're, they're, they're working on that. That's still not, not in the paper. Um, so one thing that I would have liked to have seen in, in terms of the paper is exactly what is being ruled in and what is being ruled out um, as they're specifying this. Um, a second thing that I thought was a little bit... Um, uh, there's some tension in the paper about... Um, and, you know, as you read, when you're in asymptopia, uh, you 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 see that they rule out non-homothetic uh, demand, so that's knocking out things like Linder-style models or models with um, uh, nonlinear angle curves. Uh, so so examples where let's say China ends up consuming a higher uh, spending a higher share of their income on um, on food than than the United States. But then when you got, kind of go into Hades, um, 
and you're trying to get the, the identification there, the, the non-homothenticities is, is, is important because you have, you have to have different income effects across goods. And so I thought there would be some, there's, there's a little bit of tension there, I, I think, and maybe next draft can, can deal with this. Um, and then also we're kind of knocking out non-separable utility functions, which is, which, is, which is fine. I mean, certainly that's what I often use. But again, I just kind of wanted to be clear about what is being, 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 being uh, ruled out. And then we kind of have the descent into Hades where kind of you get this nice, very nice theory and then you kind of have to go into the, into the data. Um, so as you descend into Hades, the first thing we do is let's kill all the superscripts. Um, so that, what that means is that you lose all the time-varying productivity parameters. Um, and so uh, one of the things that that means is that kind of um, uh, to the extent they use time series data, um, you, you know, everything's going to get loaded on, on, on scale. And then the second thing that they have to do is um, they have to choose a particular functional form for uh, the scale effect, which is this constant elasticity um, effect. So gamma s is that, is that scale parameter. Um, and then um, they need to uh, as assume uh, that the functional form for trade shares is CES with a trade elasticity of theta, as Dave was, 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 was saying. And so that means that there's going to be no nesting or variation uh, across countries. And so kind of a lot of my comments are going to be exactly on, on uh, that particular point. So the, the estimation equation that they have is uh, that the log of the trade share this x variable um, is going to be uh, equal to this theta times um, kind of a country pair fixed effect and a uh, importer um, sector fixed effect. And then the, the problem that they have is that um, uh, what they can only identify is the product of theta times this gamma s. Um, and so then you have this assumption that, um, sorry, I have two, 2013, that was from the paper, but it's actually 2014, uh, that, that the theta equals 5. Um, comes off of this uh, Head and Mayer paper. So I went back to the Head and Mayer paper to look at it. And it is true that the, the theta is equal to 5, so that's fair enough. But um, kind of there's a lot of variation in that parameter. And the standard deviation is 9. The median estimate is 3. Um, and if you look at like other papers that have done uh, kind of uh, uh, gotten values of that, it's 7. And so what that means is that, 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 that whatever gamma we're using is kind of very dependent on your choice of this, this, this parameter. And then I began thinking, well, should I be thinking that that parameter is, uh, is constant? And then I thought, well, probably, probably the truth is that um, you know, certainly different estimates are coming up with different values of that parameter. Um, and so uh, probably the true model is, is the one that's just, just on the second slide. So the trade share is going to be these, these first two terms plus kind of uh, some random coefficient multiplied by um, uh, uh, L. And so what might be, uh, so, so omega I, uh, ij is going to be, ijs is going to be some variation in that um, theta. And it may vary, and it may also vary with other observables. So for example, um, suppose you believe in a standard trade model, you know, and you've got one country that's 99% of the world um, and exporting to a tiny country, if that country doubles in size, its exports can't double. Um, uh, so it's going to have uh, some attenuation in that parameter. On the other hand, if you're a very small country, you know, you're 1% of the world and you double in size, well, your exports are going to come close to doubling. So what that's telling you is that, um, for example, Z might be related to country size, but country size might be related to um, uh, this LIS, and then suddenly we've got uh, a correlation in the error term. Um, and so kind of it's not obvious to me that theta is just a parameter that, that, doesn't, that doesn't vary. It could be varying with, with observables. Uh, certainly the estimates are flying all over the place, presumably because different people are using different techniques. Um, and so you know, whether you can kind of think a little bit about jointly estimating that theta for your data and, and worrying about some of these things might be an interesting thing to, to, to do. Uh, so I'm, I'm basically out of time now. Um, uh, Steve's just checking his watch, but he's going to now tell me. <laughs> One minute. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Great job. Um, so um, so uh, we're going to move from um, uh, uh, Gomorrah to Nirvana. Um, so the last part of the paper, and I don't have time to really uh, talk about their, 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 um, uh, their general equivalent model, um, but there again you kind of get the... Um, uh, you get the, the Cobb-Douglas 
uh, assumption um, across sectors. Um, and, and this part of the paper, in that sense, um, you know, we've now assumed CES, we've ass and, then, and, then, and then Cobb Douglas on top of it. Um, it's more restrictive uh, than what came before, um, and uh, hopefully they're going to kind of uh, integrate. But I think kind of one of my big comments on the paper is um, to, to make things consistent across sections um, so that the theory is consistent with, uh, you know, the theory at the beginning is consistent with the, with the empirical estimation and consistent with the, with the model at the end. Because right now, there's kind of different assumptions being made in different parts of the paper. You know, I kind of understand it. I can kind of almost uh, see the various co-authors struggling on the various sections as I was reading it. Um, and I kind of think that one, one thing that would also be good is just, um, um, you know, I understand that, that when you're doing these models, um, the, the calibration models, you can't match all the moments. But it then be clear not just about the moments that you're missing when you're assuming, let's say, that you've got a concentrated elasticity and, um, uh, you know, can you pat, catch the trade patterns? But what does it mean in, like, some of the other regressions and things like that? Um, these are great authors. This, this is a this is a, a super interesting paper, um, and I think that that they're going to be able to solve all this stuff. So hopefully they take these comments as as constructive, uh, not destructive comments. Um, so uh, it's a great paper, and let me end here. Thank you very much, David. And so we have a little time for questions um, at the end now. If anyone has a question, and we've got a couple of microphones. Uh, Dave, question for your paper. So it's really interesting. Um, when thinking about the the optimal policies that exercise at the end, am I correct that these were just these are nationally optimal policies? So have you? And when you're talking about the world average, that's just um, you know sort of averaging across these nationally optimal policies. But when you put these countries together, they're you know the 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 optimal tariff policy is going to have negative international externalities on trading partners. So can you walk us through you know when you're considering the optimal industrial policy? Are the same sort of international externalities there? Are they smaller? If you were to evaluate this at the global welfare level, you know what would we learn from from your exercise? Have you done that kind of thing yet? Um, no, the great question. I'm sorry I wasn't more clear. So absolutely, we did like the super simplest thing first, which is just take the country you're studying, say it's China, and hold all other countries in the world constant, and then just ask what will be best for China. So it's not at all globally good uh, or optimal in any sense. Um, but we should and will work on that kind of thing. The um, you know a harder problem, of course, would be the sort of globally interacting game, if you like, uh, that would be a hard problem to solve. Maybe we can try, but it would be, it's, it, it's easy to state. It's very hard to solve on a computer, but we can maybe try. The, the thing I should say, though, about the, we, that's maybe just worth saying, it's, I'm sure, it's probably obvious, but at the world level, obviously the world as a whole is closed, so it faces that kind of like fundamental constraint on um, expanding a given sector at the, the, the consumers want, you know, in the same way that I alluded to earlier. So we, so at some sense, even globally optimal industrial policy would be very, would be, would offer smaller gains than these average unilaterally optimal policies I showed you. The final thing that would be interesting to look at is, as you alluded to, this sort of almost zero-sum game nature of these things where we could look at the effect on other countries of one country's pursuing its uh, industrial policy. That's the kind of thing that easily comes out of these simulations, and I just didn't report it, but I could. Yeah, thanks. I could show with the speakers like to come up to the front. Okay, so this is a... And discuss it. This is a question also for Dave. So perhaps you can talk a little bit about the scope of these external effects. I mean, it seems to me hard to think about external effects if I don't think about the spatial scope of these effects. And because of the approach here of using trade data for this, obviously the scope is the country level. But the countries are very different. The US is very different than Belgium in size. In, in And so. You know, just thinking that as, uh, that as the spatial scope of this externalities is tricky. Of course, you know, if I have two Belgiums in this world, I would like to, you know, empty out one and put everyone in the other. Same way I would probably want to, you know, 
divide the U.S. and put everyone in one piece of the U.S. And so how do I think about this type of policies? Because at the end of the day, when we think about industrial policy, we also can think about policies that concentrate certain industries in space. And can I use these type of estimates to think about those policies, which are actually the policies on the ground that I think you know, concern policymakers a lot? So, is that on? No. Right. One, two. One, two. Okay, so I, uh, yeah, thank you, Esteban. That's another great question. I, um, you're absolutely right that the, this functional form that we're using has the features you described, that it's, um, it's aspatial uh, in some sense. Domestically, it's aspatial. Uh, but in some other sense, it's very spatially because it doesn't spill over across borders. Um, there's absolutely nothing in this machinery that wouldn't allow one to specify that function in any other way. Uh, you know, the, you, it, it, I think it can be written without loss of generality. The problems one would run into is just do we have the power, do we have the, the exogenous variation to estimate those other features? Um, and uh, I don't know. We, you know, I, I, I think we should try, and we. we but Is used to concentrate at the country level. I don't think so. I, you know, I. The basic insight is that the reliance on trade data allows you to back out those, what I was calling the kind of the right notion of aggregate productivity of a country sector. What you then project that on is what I'm calling the functional form choice of the E function. Uh, that has nothing to do with trade data. So the E function we used had the weird spatial properties you referred to. Um, we could use a different E function and see whether the data supports the notion that Belgium's economies of scale come partially from its proximity to Holland uh, within sectors or across sectors, that kind of thing. You know, I'm a little nervous that those, those estimating those kinds of functions is, is is classically very hard in in um, in research settings like this one. Uh, so I'm a little nervous that just we and others don't have the economy, the statistical power to, with the data around us to estimate features like that. But we can try. Um, as you know, I mean, Steve's uh, Berlin paper had a function like that, where there was both a within location thing and also a cross location thing. You know that 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 they were estimate able to estimate a decay rate on. So we could try that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. One question for Laura and one question for Dave. Um, Laura, you um, looked at the um, one of the things that comes out is this heterogeneity uh, across groups of, of countries, and I was just wondering where what um, that might be coming from. You, you focused on the um, the uh, imported intermediates um, uh, shares, and, and that those are different between emerging Asia versus Latin America. But in so far as, as, as you look at, at innovation investment in R&D, one, one factor uh, that would be very different uh, uh, across firms would be where they are in terms of uh, relative to the productivity frontier or almost equivalently um, where they are in terms of their uh, initial level uh, of productivity. I wonder why you did not exploit that heterogeneity across firms and to what extent uh, that might account for that regional difference that uh, emerge in Asia, most, if, if there's mostly at lower levels of income, further away from the productivity frontier, greater potential for, for catch up um, and, and, and the real exchange effect on that account might, might be stronger interacting with financial constraints or something else. So wonder if you looked at, at or, or why in general you don't exploit firm level heterogeneity on other dimensions. Um, uh, um, on Dave, um, the the estimates are very interesting, um, but there's a sense in which you know sort of we're forced forced by these you know SITC IC classification to use sort of existing clustering, um, and what we call an industry is what the statistici statisticians tell us is an industry, and I think some of the uh, so it's not entirely clear that we're capturing you know sort of these these existing industry classifications are doing double duty. They're telling us both uh, sort of the universe of firms that generate the external effect, and there you don't allow for heterogeneity, you're simply summing up, right, to the, the total employment in the sector. 
Um, and, and that might be doing some damage to reality because we might think again in the same spirit of my the previous question to Laura, you know, firms are highly heterogeneous. You know, some firms might be the ones who are actually going to generate the external effects. If you're really a poor performing, low productivity firms, you know, it's not clear that you generate external effects. So that that. Um, is uh, partly related to David's point about sort of that, you know, what is generating the external effects, and and you know, if you're closer to the frontier, you're employing more skilled labor, you know, that might be uh, different. Uh, so that's an additional source, um, and then the second aspect, which you said as your um, future work in terms of you know whether these spill over to other sectors as well through linkages and other things. But aside from that, it seems that there's also this potential uh, within sector heterogeneity in terms of who generates the external effects that might depress, you know, the aggregate, you know, when you get, look at the aggregate within the sector, you're going to get a lo lower estimate of the external effect because you're aggregating. No, that's um, great. That's a uh, great suggestion. We we had thought of why we were not getting results in the industrialized countries, in part because they tend to export and import more within firm, but but also they tend to be more integrated, and because um, in terms of financial development, be they're better. But that is a great suggestion. We can exploit a differences towards some some measure of frontier, um, and so just thanks. Thank you again for the question. I I see two parts. I mean, the first part is yeah, what what is the right notion of an industry for these these sorts of questions? So that's a very very important point. I think that the statistical groupings into industries that we have are just plausibly quite outdated and wrong for this sort of um, endeavor. So yeah, we're you know that's something we can work on. I mean, a nice feature of the trade data, as you as you know, I first learned from some of your work, Danny, is is you know just it can be much 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 richer in terms of product groupings than domestic output data is. And this exercise, the first step, just figuring out that right notion of industry productivity, could be done at very at the same level of an industry in the trade data, which is much much more narrow than what I was showing you today. So that first step, we're good. You know, it's the second step when you sort of project it on a measure of industry size that you need some kind of industry size proxy, which we're currently using as labor. But you can do that as as I know also from your work at like for example the four digit level in a lot of data sets nowadays. So I think we can make progress there. Um, you know the, but you're right. This all sort of comes back to your second question, as you know, that that sort of uh, and relates to Esteban and David's points about the what is the right functional form to be using to l estimate these external economies. You know, I, I think as I tried to say to Esteban, you know, the first step is correct in this world, regardless of that functional form. It's the second step that requires you to take a stand on a functional form, and ideally with lots of data. Maybe this is not in Hades, but in uh, in. Um, the uh, asymptopia, uh, we could do this, but you know, I, I I don't think it's impossible. And to me, the this setup offers to me what I think is the right way to start thinking about it is sort of just something you know try out, you know, explore in the data the the presence of different e functions, like one that maybe is heterogeneous across firm size within the sector. The, however, I would say that you know it's it's not as if we're underestimating economies of scale here. I mean, if your if your industry has small firms on which there's no EES and big in, big firms on which there are big EESs, then obviously on average in the industry there's a medium sized EES, and that's what we would be picking up, right? And that would be the right notion on the margin for that industry, I think, for a lot of questions. But so I I wouldn't want to say that it's like we're underestimating the right marginal elasticity at the moment, but. Okay, but we can, yeah, I see how that's, that depends on the question of interest, yeah. And, um, and also the variation we're using, I mean, obviously whenever you run a regression like an estimation like this, you have to know, you want to know like who in your data set is driving it, you know, that, that this could be driven by big countries with only big firms. You know, that kind of thing would, would then lead to a bias. It's correct in sample, but it would be the wrong estimate for some different sample of small countries. But. Thanks very much. That's a terrific session. I know there are a couple of other further questions, but to keep on track, I should probably hand over to Esteban uh, for the next session now. Okay. 15 minute coffee break. <laughs> <laughs>